Okay, so now that we've discussed um, how we're going to actually increase the force with which the heart contracts, i.e. by increasing the amplitude of these calcium spikes, but making sure that the resting level of calcium does not go up, then uh, what we now want to discuss is how we're actually going to increase these, the size of these calcium spikes in response to uh, beta-adrenergic stimulation that comes from the sympathetic nervous system. Okay, so let's get another piece. Well, actually, we'll go back to here. We'll go back to our original place that we were now. So, uh, the postganglionic neurons which innovate the heart, so these are the neurons which are actually going to um, synapse with the cardiomyocytes. Uh, these are called the cardiac nerves, okay, or the cardiac sympathetic nerves. Right, and they're going to release noradrenaline, uh, which is also known by the name norepinephrine, norepinephrine. And in fact, noradrenaline is all one word to get rid of that, um, that um, slash, uh, nepiephrine. Epinephrine. Okay, norepinephrine. Now, the structure of norepinephrine, we'll just go over this. Okay, so the structure of norepinephrine is that you have uh, two carbons here. It's basically the structure of tyrosine modified. Okay, so here's the amino group of the amino acid, tyrosine. Here's where the alpha carbon would have been. Here's a hydrogen. And, well, actually, the alpha carbon is still there, but here's where the carboxyl group would have been, the carboxylic acid group. But now we've replaced that with a hydrogen. Now, in the normal tyrosine, what you would have is a single methylene group here, and then you'd have a, hydro, uh, um, a um, phenyl group here, so a benzene ring, okay? And then it would have two, a single hydroxyl off in the case of tyrosine. Okay, so I'm finding this quite confusing, saying, trying to show you the structure of tyrosine and noradrenaline at the same time. So I'll draw the structure of noradrenaline and then show you how it's similar to the structure of tyrosine. So this is the structure of noradrenaline or norepinephrine. The structure of tyrosine then, the amino acid tyrosine, is here's the amino group, here's the alpha carbon with a hydrogen off the alpha carbon, and a carboxylic acid group down here. Okay? And then you'd have a methylene group here, so you wouldn't have that hydroxyl group that comes off there. And then what you'd have is this benzene ring here. Okay, and then you've got a hydroxyl group coming off the benzene ring. This is tyrosine here. Okay, so norepinephrine or noradrenaline is basically synthesized from tyrosine, and you just make these small modifications to the structure of tyrosine. So we are now going to release noradrenaline or norepinephrine onto the cardiomyocytes, and we're going to see how uh, this is going to result in increased inotropy of the heart, i.e. an increased calcium spike. Okay, right, so let me get some more paper. So, the norepinephrine is going to act on a beta-1 adrenergic receptor. So, let me draw this here. So, in the membrane of cardiomyocytes, so let's say this is the membrane of a cardiomyocyte. So, this is the sarcolemma here. So, this is the sarcolemma. In the membrane of a cardiomyocyte, you have um, sarcolemma. In the membrane of a cardiomyocyte, you have beta-1 adrenergic receptors. And I'll draw the two layers of the phospholipid by there. Now, beta-1 adrenergic receptors are an example of a G-protein coupled receptor, i.e. they have seven transmembrane regions, or seven membrane-spanning domains. So, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Okay, so this here is our beta-1 receptor. Again, it's a receptor for noradrenaline. So, um, it's got seven transmembrane regions, so it's a G-protein coupled receptor. A GPCR is the shorthand for G-protein coupled receptor. And basically, it's going to be coupled to a heterotrimeric G-protein. Okay, so let me now discuss with you what heterotrimeric G-proteins are. So, let me draw a heterotrimeric G-protein here. Heterotrimeric G proteins consist of three different subunits. They consist of an alpha subunit, a beta subunit, and then on the end here, 
a gamma subunit. So this is the gamma subunit. Okay, now when you build a heterotrimeric G protein, there are many different ways that you can build them. The reason being that in the human genome, there are 16 different alpha subunits you can use. There are five different beta subunits you can use. And there are 12 different gamma subunits you can use. So there is a huge scope for making a many, many different heterotrimeric G proteins. Now, the type of G protein, the type of heterotrimeric G protein, uh, that a G protein is referred to as, i.e. the name of the whole heterotrimeric G protein, reflects which alpha subunit you use. So the G protein's name is based on which alpha subunit you use. So the beta-1 receptor is coupled to a GS, G heterotrimeric G protein, and this S stands for stimulatory. Now, what that means is it means that the alpha subunit that you used to make your heterotrimeric G protein is a specific one of these 16 alpha subunits that you had available to you. Specifically, it is the alpha S subunit, okay? So you had 16 possible choices. Alpha S is one of these 16 choices. And if you are a GS uh, heterotrimeric G protein, it means that the alpha subunit was this alpha S subunit, okay? We do not know what the beta and the gamma subunit are. The name of the G protein only tells us what the alpha subunit is. Okay, right. So, heterotrimeric G proteins have two states. In fact, all G proteins have two states. They have an on state and an off state. And in the off state, the alpha subunit of the G protein has guanosine diphosphate, GDP, bound to it. So here is guanosine diphosphate. Okay, so I will colour in the alpha subunit in pink. So we'll have the alpha subunit here outlined in pink. And we'll have the guanosine diphosphate outlined in red, okay? So in red here is the guanosine diphosphate. Okay, so currently the heterotrimeric G protein is in its off conformation. Uh, now, when the G protein is in its off conformation, and before the um, G protein coupled receptor, this beta 1 receptor, has been activated, in some cases of G protein coupled receptors, the inactive heterotrimeric G protein is actually physically linked to the inactive G protein coupled receptor. In other cases, the inactive heterotrimeric G protein is instead bound to the inner leaflet of the phospholipid bilayer, which is this inner layer of phospholipids. So this is the inner leaflet here. Okay, and then the outer layer of phospholipids is the outer leaflet. So the inner leaflet is this one here, okay? Uh, so the heterotrimeric G protein can be bound to this inner leaflet, and therefore it's whizzing around effectively on the inner aspect of the phospholipid bilayer. So it's nearby the, uh, the G protein coupled receptor for when the G protein coupled receptor becomes active. So there's, there's two scenarios, the one where it's actually physically linked and the other where it's not physically linked but they're still very close by. Either way, we say that the G protein coupled receptor is coupled to the heterotrimeric G protein. Now, when noradrenaline is released onto our cardiomyocytes, so here comes noradrenaline, it's going to bind to the beta-1 receptor here, and the beta-1 receptor is going to gain catalytic activity. So it was formerly inactive, and now, once the noradrenaline has bound to this beta-1 receptor, which I'm displaying here in green, um, the beta-1 receptor becomes active, and what it's going to do is it's going to break off this GDP, this guanosine diphosphate, which is bound to the alpha subunit of our heterotrimeric GSG protein, and it's going to instead grab a molecule of GTP, guanosine triphosphate, from the cytoplasm of the cell, and it's going to bind this guanosine triphosphate to the alpha subunit instead. So what you'll end up with is an alpha subunit, which is bound to GTP. Okay, so here's our alpha S subunit, and now it's got guanosine triphosphate bound to it, GTP here. Okay, right, so the alpha subunit is here in this violent pink, okay, and the guanosine triphosphate we'll have in orange.
Okay, so you now put GTP bound to this alpha S subunit. And by the way, this is often referred to as an alpha S GTP complex. Uh, and once the GTP is bound to the alpha subunit, we now say that the alpha subunit is in its on state. So this is effectively the on state, okay? And when the uh, alpha S subunit is in its on state, i.e. bound to GTP, it no longer wants to associate with the beta and the gamma subunit. The beta and the gamma subunit remain bound to one another, so they keep with each other, and they are henceforth referred to as the beta-gamma subunit. But they are not allowed, they don't associate basically with the alpha S once it's got GTP bound to it. So off goes the beta gamma and off goes the alpha S GTP, they're separate ways. Okay, so this splits into these two different bits. Right, and now what's going to happen is this alpha S GTP is going to go and activate adenylyl cyclase enzymes. And we'll continue this discussion in the next video.